It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm Iman Wahid and uh, professor of environmental occupational health at the department at uh, FHS. So it's a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Professor Stan Verman, for today's special seminar on climate change and health. I've met uh, Dr. Verman Stan a couple of times in the US at the annual meetings of the Association of CIF accredited schools and programs of public health, and more intensively during my research leave in 2022 at Yale University. I can best describe Dr. Verman as a friend of our Faculty of Health Sciences here at AUB and a friend of the region. He's keen on establishing close and strong relationships with our school, as well as other academic public health institutions in the region to support in building public health capacity and research and practice. I'm personally thankful for the support of Professor Verman and his facilitation of the two current joint research and training programs between Yale and AUB, namely MENA PER for injury prevention and GeoHealth MENA for environmental and occupational health. Professor Sten is an infectious disease epidemiologist, a pediatrician, and an endowed professor of public health at the Yale School of Public Health. Until recently, he was the dean of the school and led its exemplary engagement in the COVID-19 pandemics as well as the efforts to transform the Yale School of Public Health from being a department in the School of Medicine after how many years? 60, 70 years? 100 years. For 100 years, the Yale School of Public Health has been a department in the School of Medicine. And before he stepped down, he made sure that the school now is an independent school of public health at uh, Yale University. His past positions included directorship of the Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health. Professor Verman works in resource limited settings on maternal, infant, and child health, notably focused on HIV AIDS, sexually transmitted uh, infections, COVID-19, and parasitic diseases. His work in implementation science seeks to increase coverage and quality of HIV and chronic disease services for children and families. Finally, Dr. Verman is a member of the National Academy of Medicine in the US. So welcome and please join me in welcoming Dr. Verman. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your warm welcome. Uh, it's been a, a dream uh, of mine as long as I can remember to come to Beirut uh, and I finally made it better late than never, and I hope uh, it will be the first of many visits. So um, I've uh, chosen this theme today uh, for obvious reasons. I think we all know that this is a, a major challenge that uh, we're facing uh, as a human race and as a globe. And uh, I press this button, nothing happens. Let's see if I press this one, maybe. No, that. There, there we go. So if we look at uh, this uh, time series from 1884, which is uh, the first year where reliable uh, global temperature estimates uh, are available through uh, 2021, uh, as you see uh, red and yellow emerge, uh, these are increased uh, temperatures from, uh, from global averages in the early part of the century. And uh, you don't see too much until you hit the 1980s. And starting in the 1980s, you have this inexorable um, uh, global warming phenomenon where at the present time, um, the last uh, nine years have been the warmest in recorded history. Each of the nine years has been among the warmest recorded. And of the, of the last, the, the 10 hottest years in history, all you have to do is go back to 1996, pluck that one out, and then the last nine years. So we are uh, certainly in, in, um, in uh, uh, uncharted waters. Um, we've seen record levels of heat trapping greenhouse uh, gases uh, uh, driving the global temperature more than uh, one degree centigrade above pre-industrial levels 
And uh, the consequences have been, uh, as you've seen in the news, massive loss of sea ice and ice sheet mass, a rise in sea level, uh, longer and intense heat waves and major habitat change. Uh, greenhouse gases are just going up, 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 up. Uh, all of the mitigation uh, efforts have essentially slowed the rise, but have not reversed the rise. So uh, today we're putting out more greenhouse gases than we did yesterday and, and last year, and uh, more than the previous year. So don't, don't be fooled. We are not making much progress uh, in uh, reversing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, here's another uh, quick movie. Uh, this is of Antarctic ice mass changes from 2002 to 2020. And uh, the, the mass is in mass loss uh, uh, on the chart is in gigatons. I can't really conceptualize a gigaton, but it sounds like a really a large amount of ice. And um, and you can sort of see where the continent is warming most uh, dramatically. Now, in these um, uh, red zones, we've been seeing phenomena that are unlike anything we've seen before. For example, a few years ago, we had the they call it calving. So, uh, you know, a, a cow has a baby; it's a calf. So you calf uh, and calving is what they call the break off of a very large chunk of ice. So some of you know the geography of the United States and our smallest state is the state of Rhode Island, which is right next to the state of Connecticut where I live, fairly near Boston. So um, an ice mass broke off into the ocean, uh, the size of the state of Rhode Island. So it's it's hard to conceptualize. Rhode Island is a small state, but it's I'd be interested in knowing, you know, how many Rhode Islands can you put into Lebanon? I should I should is the same size. Okay. So 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 I was thinking maybe two of them, but you're you're smaller than I thought. So <laughs> so uh, so uh, a, 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 a ice mass the size of Lebanon carved carved out. Now that doesn't change global sea ice um, uh, the minute it, it breaks off, but over the next decade it melts. And that's the kind of thing that is resulting in, in, sea, in sea rise. So these are phenomenon we've never seen before. We've never seen anything like this in recorded history happening in Antarctica. It's all new. Uh, the other thing that's happening, uh, not only in Antarctica, but in our glacial uh, uh, zones, is we're, we're seeing rivers within glaciers. So with, with accelerated uh, ice uh, melt, uh, you start with phenomenon of, of water flow. And it's like a vicious circle. The, the more you create water flow, the faster you melt the ice. Um, here are the 48 uh, U.S. states, not including Alaska and Hawaii, which are somewhat unique. Uh, and you can see temperature anomalies. In other words, how um, distorted are temperatures from historic baselines. And you don't see much in the early um, 20th century. But starting in the 1980s, there's just an inexorable rise with excess temperatures. And uh, one can see that globally as well. Uh, with the same analytic strategy used by meteorologists. And um, the worst offenders are my country and the country of China. Uh, the U.S. for years was the uh, number one polluter on the planet uh, in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, we are 4.5% of the human race, Americans are, uh, but we represent 20% of global energy consumption. 4.5% 4, 4, of the population consumes 20% of the energy. So we are an extremely energy efficient, inefficient country. Um, China is now the world's number one polluter. You can see that they took the lead in about 26, 27, somewhere around there. 
uh, and uh, but they also have such a vast population compared to us. You know, nearly 1.4 billion people. The United States has 335 million people, so a, a population that's uh, five times the size of the U.S. So, the you 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 know it. Yeah, we we're concerned that uh, that that's now there are some revised estimates uh, that were the five four point five and the twenty percent that I gave earlier, but this is a little couple of years ago was a little lower. But if you see China's population seventy point five percent, they use about twenty four percent of global energy. Uh, here are uh, greenhouse gas emissions from a variety of countries. Um, the EU is the is the red, the US the yellow, um, China in blue, Japan and India for comparison. So you can see Japan, uh, which is not a particularly energy efficient country, but much more energy efficient than we are, um, not too much change despite uh, its large population. India is on its on on the way up. Um, uh, and uh, China, massive increase because of industrialization uh, and prosperity. I mean, people buying cars, they couldn't afford it before. The EU doing remarkably well, actually. And, um, and we'll, we can talk about that later, if you like. And the US not reversing uh, its trends, but actually getting worse. Uh, and uh, it's really China's fast growth in industrialization and prosperity that's resulted in disproportionate rise in energy consumption. And since they are uh, quite addicted to their low cost coal and they burn more coal, uh, China and India burn more coal than the rest of the world combined, um, it's, it's energy inefficient uh, energy production. And there's coal, global consumption excluding China and global consumption of China. And it's almost China by itself that's 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 equaling global consumption. And you look at China's energy sources, 71% coal. I think US is down to about 5%. There's India and the surface temperature of India in the last 50 years, inexorable rise. So you take a hot country and make it hotter. Here's the Middle East, and this Köppen climate classification is a little more detailed than you're going to be able to absorb in a minute, but, but arid desert is essentially the, the red. And you can see how vast uh, the, uh, the uh, deserts are in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, dry summer, uh, hot summer uh, uh, sort of characterizes uh, Lebanon and much of Israel, West Bank, and parts of Jordan, so and, and big parts of, of Turkey. So we're very vulnerable in this part of the world because we already are dry, we're already warm, and, uh, and, uh, and one can expect even disproportionate impacts on human health. And that was uh, June 6th of um, 2021, a historically hot day in which, um, temperatures uh, reached uh, uh, vast uh, levels, historic levels. Rainfall predictions are also a concern. Um, sometimes global warming uh, results in increased humidity in the air, increased evaporation phenomena, both from ocean and lake and river uh, areas, but that can have a mischievous impact on rainfall. Sometimes rainfall is increased in some uh, ge uh, geologic zones, but in other areas, you'll have a decline in rainfall. And we're, they're, they're predicting a decline in rainfall in the Middle East. Now we have these, um, uh, have you heard the term canary in a coal mine? So uh, 50, 100 years ago, the miners would literally carry a, a canary and because it, if the canary died, it meant that there was methane and they had better get out of the, the mine. So the canary in the coal mine becomes a, a metaphor for uh, what's happening to some of our freshwater uh, seas. So the, the Aral Sea is a great example in Uzbekistan, uh, Lake Chad uh, at the border of Chad and Niger and Nigeria, the Dead Sea here in your neighborhood. 
um, with lower rainfall, higher temperatures, the Dead Sea has shrunk a third in the past 20 years. And um, I visited the Dead Sea a um, couple of times in the early 1980s, and I had occasion to visit a couple of times uh, in the 2000s, including a month ago. And the whole southern part of the Dead Sea is now a fraction of what it used to be. You know how the Dead Sea is sort of in two parts, uh, and in the southern part as a fraction of what it used to be. With with, And I went to the Jordan River, which is a fraction of what it used to be. Um, and uh, farmers and civilians are siphoning off the River Jordan, uh, such that, and understandable why they're doing so, uh, uh, and is, the Israeli population has increased especially, and, uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, harvesting of uh, Jordan River water even before it gets to the Jordan border. And uh, Alexandria, uh, which is a population of 5 million people, is literally sinking with, uh, at the same time that sea level rises are occurring, uh, and this could uh, be dire for um, uh, future prospects. Um, um, storm surges uh, are not especially common in the Mediterranean, but when they do happen, it could be quite serious. And the driest parts of the regions are paradoxically suffering from flooding. Um, you get sudden fierce storms, you get extreme weather phenomena. Uh, in uh, in uh, we'll talk about what happens in the in the uh, rivers that come from the Himalaya in in a little while, and of course you've got desertification in the Sahel, where in some parts of the Sahel you have a hundred kilometers of desert sort of gobbling up what used to be uh, grazing land, and people have being displaced because if they can't um, raise their animals or they can't do their their subsistence farming. Um, because of water and heat phenomena, they have to move. We call those climate migrants. And this day that I mentioned on the previous slide, June 6, 2021, temperatures reached uh, 54 degrees in Kuwait and uh, in uh, Iraq. And uh, 54 degrees gets to the point where it's it's really not compatible with, with human life. If your air conditioner breaks on a day that it's 54 degrees, you could die of heat stroke, especially if you're elderly and vulnerable. And just a little statistic, Pakistan is deemed the fifth most vulnerable country to climate change. And I didn't look it up, but I think Pakistan is about the sixth or seventh largest country in the world population-wise. So here, here we have a phenomenon where a vast population is, is in the top five in terms of vulnerability to climate change. So just a few words on the Sahel. I, I, I use these slides in, in, in Chad, and um, so I, I translate them to the French. And then, so last night I, I said, wait a minute, the French is in big letters and the English is in small letters. So I flipped it. But uh, so here, here is you know um, uh, the dry lands, uh, dry lands of the world. You've got things like the Kalahari Desert, the Sahara Desert. Um, uh, you know, you you have um, um, de vast deserts in, in North America. You know, for those of you not familiar, I mean the Mojave Desert and others. Uh, most of the West, and I don't know if you tracked any of this, but. But we're getting all the news from um, our, our journalists about the crisis in the Colorado River Basin, where the Colorado River has become so small that it's no longer feeding the vast reservoirs of Lake Powell and Lake Mead, which serve Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Phoenix, these huge growing cities in the west of the United States. And they've gotten so low that they, they, they run the risk of not even driving the turbines, turbine uh, energy uh, uh, of the dams because at some point it, they, they, there's not enough water and they have to shut the turbines down. Now, we, we dodged a bullet this year because of heavy snowfall. So temporarily, uh, there's enough uh, Colorado River water to uh, stem this. But it's just temporary. 
these are these are these are these are phenomena that have taken decades to evolve and uh and uh as soon, you know we've had eight years of drought and this year we didn't have a drought so what's going to happen eight more years of drought and we're going to be up against these so even the highest income countries of the world are facing crisis circumstances particularly in particular parts of of the region and um and you can see how well represented desert is in the middle east um sahel means shore in arabic i'm told is that correct okay good <laughs> i'm coming here to tell you what it means in arabic that's 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 really cheeky of me uh it lies between the desert and the fertile grasslands of the south long dry seasons and wet seasons i i, I know they they have uh they have moisture coming up now in uh, June, July, um, uh, and and they'll have rains. Uh, but the droughts have been severe, and you know the famine in uh, in Somalia and uh, Ethiopia, famines all over the region. Um, and uh, the Sahara is is gobbling up large uh, swaths of the Sahel. Now. Um, I wouldn't know anything about this because I'm not a political scientist and I'm not a meteorologist, but I read uh, very reliable sources that highlighted the severe and uh, drought in Syria that, that occurred for three years prior to the breakout of the Civil War. And, um, and, um, and the writer was speculating that this was a major contributor to the civil war because nobody was crazy about Bashir unless you were on his payroll. But um, you you went about your life. You 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 know. But but when you when you couldn't feed your family anymore, then the um, the oppression from the central sources became unacceptable and. So this may be the new normal. We may end up with um, emerging geopolitical crises that are very directly tied to global climate change. And overuse of land uh, is a phenomenon all over the world. Uh, I was born in 1954, and there were 2.3 billion people roughly on planet Earth at that time. So in my lifetime, we now have 8 billion. And at the turn of the uh, century of the, of the, of the uh, 19th century, um, uh, there weren't even, uh, weren't even a billion people. So you see how, how the pressures on Mother Earth have been so vast by the growth of uh, human populations. Uh, and this is affecting places like the Sahel. So it's an example of uh, climate change, agricultural practices, political processes, and population pressures all combined to uh, result in desertification. Um, and keep in mind that, uh, you know, you, you fuel wood gathering and stock overgrazing uh, will reduce vegetation coverage. And the so-called albedo phenomenon, uh, the albedo effect, is when light surfaces like snow or a road made of sand reflect, reflect heat. Whereas if you then do a black asphalt road or you melt the snow and reveal the rock, you uh, absorb heat. So uh, uh, even, a, even a, a snowfall that melts a week or two earlier than it has historically is a little bit of a uh, an albedo effect in the in the vicious circle kind of phenomenon. And if you pave over vast amounts of space, as in as we do with urbanization, you have this albedo al albedo effect. Now, less vegetation means less evaporation and trans transpiration, so less water vapor in the atmosphere, and uh, this can be also a vicious circle. So just to remind you of just how vast the desert is in Africa and, and long periods without rain, as you well know. And here are the precipitation anomalies. And um, you don't see too much green here. 
So anomalies compared to historic averages. And compared to historic averages, some green, some, some pink, but here it's mostly pink, meaning mostly drought. Here's Lake Chad. Um, persistent drought and water diversion has shrunk the lake to about um, one-tenth its former size, so 1972 down to 2001. The, the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan is virtually gone, just diverted uh, uh, the tributaries for cotton production in the former Soviet era, and now it's gone. So no more fishing in lake uh, in, in the Aral Sea, no more tourism in the Aral Sea, and no more people living in the Aral Sea. Now, of all the phenomena, we're not sure, but this may be the most seri serious thermohaline circulation. So the ocean is a vast heat store uh, and uh, has um, uh, almost rivers within it. So the most famous is probably the Gulf Stream. You've all heard of the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream, which is this, is warm waters that, 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 that sort of flow across the Atlantic up past Iceland and past England and past Scandinavia. Here's Iceland. And Iceland and Norway, they have no business having anybody live there because they're at the uh, latitude of Northern Siberia, Northern Alaska, Northern uh, 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 Canada, and nobody lives there. I don't mean nobody, but very, very small populations. Lots of people live in Norway. Lots of people live in, in Iceland and it's because of the Gulf Stream which modulates the temperature and makes it habitable. So you can have a, a, a season where you can grow crops and the, and the like. So um, what happens is the, the polar regions have the um, deep um, channels, the deep um, circulating channels towards the equator where the water rises and essentially is converted into these warm channels. This is called thermohaline circulation, the most famous of which is the meridional overturning circulation of the Atlantic uh, system. But we also have systems in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So internal variability from the Atlantic Ocean uh, may have dampened the magnitude of global warming over the historic era, 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 era because the oceans themselves are uh, the number one sink for um, CO2 and can absorb vast amounts of heat. Um, however, um, we have seen the first slowing of the uh, thermohaline circulation uh, ever recorded. So the, 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 the circulation is slowing and we do not know what that means. We know that we've been displacing um, um, fish populations. So codfish that used to be fished at a certain um, uh, latitude are now fished only north of that latitude. So we've displaced fish populations that, that, uh, that uh, can no longer tolerate the heat. We also know what we're doing to global reefs where we're blanching these reefs when the waters become too warm uh, for the uh, coral that have adapted to a previous temperature uh, cannot tolerate the higher temperature. They can't, they can't adapt fast enough because um, they don't have 10,000 years, 20,000, 30,000 years to, 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 for, for, for selective pressures to select the corals that can thrive. They have two, three, four, five, ten 10 years and they're, they're blanched and destroyed. So um, this could be even the most serious, but we don't know yet. So global warming affects storm formation intensity as, as temperatures rise. Um, when you're near oceans, uh, more and more water vapor evaporates into the atmosphere. I told you about it's mischievous what happens on land. Sometimes you have more uh, uh, water vapor, but a lot of times you have less. But near oceans, you have more water vapor. And um, this increases storm wind speed, the warmer your surface area. It's also true on land. 
so tornadoes can be more severe. And, um, and we mentioned that snow reflects heat while rock absorbs it so that you can end up with new cycles of floods and droughts that we'll talk about later. So there are vast costs to this. I just use examples from the United States. Uh, Hurricanes Katrina, Harvey, Irma, Maria, Dorian. These are hundreds of billions of dollars of, of costs, real world costs in terms of damaged property, uh, damaged businesses, uh, emergency response, mortality, morbidity. And, uh, and we're seeing these more frequently and more severely. Harvey is, is, is an interesting one, 2017, where essentially the, the uh, hurricane parked itself over the um, city of Houston and sat there for three years, churning, uh, three days, churning and churning and churning. With, with unprecedented damage to that city. Another feature is the fact that uh, you expand vector-borne diseases when you have a war when it's warmer and when it's moister. So the opportunity um, for mosquito-related infections or other vector-related infections to be more efficient in 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 the transmission cycles is 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 present. Let's use malaria as an example. So as you may recall, um, the, if, 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 if a malarious mosquito bites me and I, I have malaria, picks it up, but it takes eight to 12 days for the sexual stage to uh, mature in the mosquito where the male and female gametocyte find each other, uh, make gorgeous love, and you end up with the oocyte maturing in the, um, uh, in the gut. And uh, after a number of days, the sporozoites mature, migrate to the salivary glands. So that takes a while. So mosquitoes harmless to you if it bites you before that, that cycle is completed. But what is it about uh, the environment that helps a mosquito live longer? Warmer, moister. So if it's warmer and moister, the mosquitoes live longer. And even a small fraction even 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 the the average lifespan of the mosquito increasing by a single day can have a disproportionate uh, impact on the on the on the um, uh, proportion of malaria infected mosquitoes that are malarious if they bite you. So the modelers have some pretty scary models suggesting that even half temperature, half degree centigrade temperature increases and the, the mischief that that can do in, in, uh, in malaria zones. And there are many other diseases, I won't go through them, but every one of these is expected to be increased risk with um, global warming. This is a model from Zimbabwe in which um, uh, circumstances of 2000 are mapped and then they model what is likely to happen with global warming. So the highly malaria zones are in red, and now you see what the country looks like in, by 2050. Um, I mentioned population pressures, and this is a pretty good example. So this is Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, slide is in, in French, and, um, and they are the countries that border the vast Lake Victoria. Perhaps some of you have been to Lake Victoria. and um, and you go back to 1960, and the density of the population was less than 25 persons per uh, square kilometer, except for the areas that are um, a little darker yellow, that would be 25 to 100, and then limited areas, mostly uh, Kisumu area of Kenya, uh, um, uh, where, where, where you have... Um, 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 urban populations. But now look at it in 2015. So what happens when you have these sorts of population pressures at the, at the microecological level is overfishing, overgrazing, deforestation, farmland pressures, and eventually hunger and climate refugees. And this is happening as we speak in the Lake Victoria area. They are, they are harvesting fish smaller than they ever, through through 
traditional knowledge, fisher folk knew not to take the small fish back. Now they're harvesting those small fish and selling them because they have to feed their families. So what's happening here in, is a little bit of an example of what happened in the Grand Banks of North America, the Grand Banks off of uh, Newfoundland and Maine, that part was the richest cod fishing area in the world. It actually had a big role in the history of the Western civilization, the codfish that uh, were uh, harvested there, um, the, 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 the meat, the principal part of the fish went to uh, the colonial masters in, in Portugal and Spain to feed the people, and the bony parts and less desirable parts were used to feed the slaves in the uh, West Indies. In the, uh, the British would buy it to, as slave food. And there's an interesting book, it's called Cod, written by a guy named Kurlansky. It's a very thin book, about 140 pages. If you ever have a chance to read it, it reads like an adventure story. It's all about cod. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> I've given it to friends of mine. They all go, that's a great book. So um, the, the, that we, we, we started getting smaller fish. So we started getting trawler, trawler fishing. Instead of line fishing, we started using trawler, uh, trawlers to collect fish and vast uh, uh, nets to collect fish. So we collected all the baby fish and there no, there's no more cod in the Grand Banks. The richest cod fishing in global history and it has not recovered in 40 years. And predictions are it'll, it'll never recover. So Lake Victoria is in trouble because of its population pressures. Now, this is what's happened over the really long period of time. 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, we had, if you take away the, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and the, and the high mountains, which you know just are not habitable, take that away. So that is um, um, uh, leaving the 71% uh, of the Earth's land surface. So in the 71%, you have uh, more than half were forests and the rest were wild grasslands. And it didn't change much 5,000 years ago. And to be honest, it didn't change much in year 1700. You had about 3% in crops and 6% in grazing. But by 1900, you were down to less than half of the 71% of the planet that were forests and you also had a shrinkage of wild grassland, uh, sorry, grasslands here quite remarkably because it was being used for crops and grazing. Why? Because now we had uh, 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 population growth. But by 2018, we're down to less than 40% forests, 15% crops, 31% grazing land, and a paltry 14% wild grassland and shrubs. So we have profoundly and inextricably altered the planet that we inherited. Biodiversity is threatened. This is a global living planet index uh, measuring biodiversity and it's continuing to decline. And we have these um, circumstances that again, um, they're dire predictions. Um, this is the Himalaya. Okay, there's Kathmandu, Lhasa, Lahore, Islamabad. And every time you see a big fat, um, red marker, that is a substantial uh, decline in uh, glacierized areas. So those are glaciers that are shrinking markedly. And what happens when a glacier shrinks? It releases water and you end up um, uh, with um, mischief feeding some of the vast river valleys, the Indus uh, here, uh, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, and the Mekong River Valleys. And there are more than one and a half billion people who make their livings off of these river valleys in Asia. And um, they've documented now three weeks shorter uh, time periods between snowmelt onset and, debt and, and, and end dates compared to history, historical. So that's three weeks of this albedo effect, three weeks where it was white snow, but now it's dark rock. 
so it's absorbing, absorbing heat, heat instead of reflecting sunlight. So snow reflects, rock absorbs. Um, rainfalls are earlier and increasing. So what's happening is we're having earlier floods. Have you read about the floods in Pakistan in recent years? Earlier floods and later droughts. Now, um, farmers do the best they can, but there's a point at which the floods are devastating and the droughts are devastating. So we, it's just so ironic to see the, the angst that we get in Europe uh, with immigrants from Syria and uh, uh, immigrants in the US from Latin America and how we're overwhelmed by these people. We haven't seen anything compared to what we're gonna see in the next 20 years. It, it's, uh, wars are paltry compared to phenomena like these. So uh, how we're going to cope with people who can no longer farm on their lands uh, because they're inundated or they're um, drought stricken is, is an unknown. And uh, how do we measure droughts and deluges? Uh, you can see that uh, both droughts and floods are becoming more frequent, both, which sounds contradictory, but I hope I've explained it. Now, there's a lot that we can do. We have a word called mitigation. Mitigation is sort of what the energy people and the, the engineers and, uh, and uh, the policy people can do, and that is to reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. I'm not particularly influential as a public health physician in, in, in mitigation. This is very much uh, our business communities, our politicians, our engineers, but we can have much more efficient transportation in industry. It's mind boggling how little um, solar energy is being harvested. This, this vast energy source. And solar panels have dropped in price to the point where it's cheaper to uh, produce a kilowatt of energy by a solar panel than it is by burning fossil fuel. So the excuse that we can't afford it anymore is a bogus excuse. That's what the oil companies will tell you. And that's what the politicians who are getting money from the oil companies will tell you but it's not true. It's cheaper to generate a kilowatt by solar energy now. And what a resource we have in the South, in the Sahel, in the Middle East. And I was, I was absolutely, I spent three days in Ajman, um, UAE uh, before coming here. And I just didn't see solar panels anywhere. It was just the most depressing thing. Let's just burn that oil. And, and I don't know, I haven't been in Beirut long enough to know, but it's, it's really discouraging. Good, well, that's it. We've got to start somewhere. So we need to power our electric cars with solar panels, buses, trains, businesses have to be powered with solar. And uh, we have to worry about healthcare sustainability because the healthcare industry is di a disproportionate polluter. You may be aware that um, anesthetic gases used for patients in surgery, only about 4% of the gases are actually metabolized. 96% are actually re-excreted uh, in breathing. And some of those gases are potent greenhouse gases, but there are techniques to recapture those gases and neutralize them. So are we doing that in the hospitals of the world? We're doing it in a fraction of the hospitals. And uh, I am all for preventing uh, um, hospital acquired infections. And in theory, I love the idea that we change gloves all the time and protect patients, take off our gowns, but we're probably overdoing it in the sense that we are um, not uh, redeploying and not sterilizing and reusing so many materials. For example, if I'm a surgeon and I have a, a cautery wand, um, I can buy a new cautery wand for the new surgery for uh, about uh, $500. 
or I can uh, reprocess the cautery wand that I had for about $30. And the reprocessing makes it sterile and, and, and makes it usable again. But we've got such a bias against it that we just do the 500, 500, 500, which is, uh, you know, material that uh, in steel and, and uh, plastic that took energy to develop. And we just, we're, we're very inefficient. So if any of you are physicians and you want to sort of start working with your hospital, there is a whole literature now on healthcare sustainability and how we can reduce the energy impact of, of a healthcare facility. We have energy conservation. And uh, and reduction in pollution. <laughs> I somehow put pollution production. I guess I meant polluted pollution reduction. Um, <clears throat> and air conditioning versus fans. I mean, we use air conditioning when we don't need to. A fan would be fine at probably a tenth the energy expenditure. Um, automatic shutoffs are not used. So you have uh, go to New York City and take a look at the bright lights of all the empty office buildings with all the lights on. And that's because uh, an office worker or an office cleaner didn't turn off the lights. You can have automatic shutoffs. Nobody's moving for 10 minutes. The light goes up. Um, LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. This used to be um, sort of US, UK, Scandinavia. Now it's worldwide. And this is a green building certification program that incentivizes architects and builders to build more energy efficient buildings. And they're often more pleasant buildings because they use the creative use of sunlight, the creative use of shading, the creative use of, of indoor atria. Often you go, you go away from this big ugly box to something that is psychologically more agreeable. Um, sustainable energy sources. Now, solar is the no-brainer. We've made progress on wind. The Danes are unbelievably sophisticated, and the Chinese on winds. I've seen vast wind farms in the North Sea that the Danes have built, and vast wind farms in in uh, uh, in China uh, uh, using wind. Water um, can be strategically used if you're lucky, and you're in you're in uh, Lebanon and you have mountains and you have streams and you can harvest some of that hydroelectric power. 100% of the uh, domestic energy uh, utilization for homes and businesses in Norway is produced by hydroelectric power. Now they're lucky that they have the geology that made that possible, but lots of places have geology, but they haven't tapped it. Uh, wave technologies are not there yet in theory. If we could figure out a way to take to take a wave motion machine that is generating energy that the, 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 but through its motion and figure out how to get that energy to land, we might find that wave would be an en entropy capture. Uh, do any of you drive a Prius or a hybrid vehicle? Any kind of hybrid? Yes, hybrid. Anybody else? One? That's not too many, but... There you, you're a pioneer. So, so the hybrid vehicles and the and the electric cars, both of them, have uh, braking systems which charge the battery. That's what we mean by entropy capture. So you can either brake. That's right. That's right. You 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 can either brake and generate heat, which is what the brake pads are going to do, or you can you can recapture that energy and charge your battery. That's what we mean by entropy capture. Um, nuclear, nuclear, nuclear. So I have been against nuclear my whole life because of safety concerns. And because, you know, I lived through uh, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, the, the movie, The China Syndrome, if you remember that old movie from the 70s with, with uh, some famous actors and, uh, you know, it was dramatization of, of a nuclear disaster. Uh, and we, we remember the history books on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the, you know, the disaster. Ukraine. Yeah, Ukraine war, I can't pronounce it, the Zaborishia. You know, it's subject to 
Russian aggression and God knows what is going to happen there. So nuclear has its complexities, but there's one country in the world that has never had a nuclear accident and has generated 80% of its um, uh, domestic energy with trivial greenhouse gas production. Some greenhouse gas production from actually building the nuclear plant. But beyond that, no greenhouse gas production. And that country is France. And, um, and they have done it safely for decades. Germany is closing, but that's a political decision. And French are reopening. That's exactly right. So the big problem we have is no longer safety. We know how to run these plants safely now. We've learned from Three Mile Island. We've learned from Chernobyl. Um, and the technologies to make sure they're monitored and, and safe. And, and uh, you remember the Japanese Fukushima? That was, that was a, a failure of design because um, the tsunami simply washed over the, the plant. It would have been uh, relatively simple to have sea walls that could have been lifted in the face with, with five minutes notice in the face of a tsunami. They didn't have that. But um, if, you, if you believe me, and I hope you don't believe me, I hope everything you, I'm saying you, you take with a grain of salt because I'm not a nuclear power expert. But if it's true that nuclear power can be done safely, we have a, a big problem. Disposal of nuclear waste. Do you know where nuclear waste is disposed of now? Low-income countries. The ocean. I, I haven't heard the right answer yet. Underground. You're all wrong. You're all wrong. It's not disposed of. Nuclear waste is retained at the nuclear power plant all over the world because they don't have any place to put it. All over the world, nuclear waste. San Onofre, if any of you have driven from San Diego, California to Los Angeles, California, you will go right past some giant bubbles, and that's the San Onofre nuclear power plant. For safety reasons, because it was built when there weren't any people around there, and now there are lots of people around, um, just for safety reasons, proximity to large population centers, they decommissioned it 20, 30 years ago. All of the nuclear waste that was generated is sitting in enclosed uh, con concrete casing on, on, um, on sort of racks hovering above the Pacific Ocean. And they say that even a bad storm wouldn't disrupt the racks and wouldn't result in the toppling of wouldn't, wouldn't. That's what they say. That's what they say. But we're not tra transporting nuclear waste. We're just keeping it where it's being generated because we have no solution. No, nobody in the world has a solution for transporting nuclear waste and safely disposing of it. So that's the big problem with nuclear. However, on th in theory, it's a great strategy to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions is you can produce vast amounts of energy with no CO2 release. Pardon me, in theory. Not too much. Yeah, not too much. If I if I'm if I'm guessing because I don't know the answer to your question, I think it's five ten percent max. I do know this French statistic was eighty percent for many decades now. Uh, and then there are the economic incentives, cap and trade, carbon credits, tax credits. That's where I'm running my fertilizer company and um, I'm generating greenhouse gases. And for me to um, make my production more efficient is gonna take me a decade of retooling my equipment and all the rest. And during that decade, I'm buying carbon credits so that I'm sending money to a reforestry organization in the Amazon or, or in the Sahel. Or, so an equivalent amount of, 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 of CO2 is being 
captured compared to what I'm releasing. Now, economists love this stuff. They say, that's what you have to do. You have to incentivize business to make the investments to make their businesses greener. Uh, climate change activists are not so sure. There's a term that's come up called greenwashing, where you continue to pollute, you continue to shove greenhouse gases out into the atmosphere, and you sort of wash it by these donations over here. And God knows if, in fact, the investments you're making are, are neutralizing all this toxic. We know how much toxic stuff you're putting in the air. We're not quite sure on the other side. Um, and then there's sustainable land use and population stabilization. It's not popular to talk about population control because people say, yeah, you want to, you, you, you want to, you know, have as many kids as you want because you're rich and you want us in the poorer countries to control our population. This is just, just sort of genocidal theory. Um, I don't happen to agree with that view. I think, I think U S China, India, Chad, Lebanon, Norway, all have to have reasonable population limits because we, 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 we have 8 billion people and we are poised to go over thresholds for climate change that are going to make the world uninhabitable. And uh, to add 2 billion more, 4 billion more, 6 billion more, it's not a good idea. Uh, and sustainable land use. If we would eat less meat and more vegetable, it takes 10 kilos of plant protein to produce one kilo of, of animal protein. So it's inefficient to have our protein intake uh, through meat. Uh, when I made this comment in a lecture I gave in India about two months ago, I started a firestorm because I didn't know this. This is the risk of some foreigner coming to a country and blabbing. Um, it turns out that there is a politicization of meat consumption in India where, where the, the Muslims are feeling put upon by the vegetarian Hindus that are pushing vegetarianism with arguments like this, but it's really just a, a Hindu nationalist agenda. And well, there you go. So it's though I, you should have given my lecture. You wouldn't have gotten in trouble, you know, but I, I, yeah, I, there was a, there was a whole firestorm that I was stepping into a Hindu Muslim debate in India about this, but I'm still going to make my point that if we eat more vegetable and less meat, we will reduce the need for grazing and we can restore um, uh, forests and, uh, and, uh, and farmlands that are more. Yeah. And it's good for your health. Yeah, it's good for your health. No, I'm trying with mitigation, I'm trying to do a systems approach. I'm trying to say policy, political, uh, industry, Systems-wise, engineering-wise, we make fundamental decisions of how to generate uh, energy differently, how to conserve it differently, how to um, uh, work on nutritional and land use policy, um, uh, uh, the approach to uh, empowering uh, women to meet unmet demand for, for family planning, um, uh, economic incentives. I'm, I'm talking really systems on this page. And <clears throat> if we don't do it at a systems level, I can buy an electric car and nobody else buys an electric car. I can put solar panels on my roof. Nobody else buys solar panels for their roofs. And, you know, it's a trivial impact. You're, you're going to have to influence at the societal level, at the industry level, 
California, interestingly, is trying to do that, the state of California in the United States. They are making their own regulations for greenhouse gas emissions that are far more severe than federal regulations. And, and, uh, and the Trump administration sued the state of California to block them from doing this because the auto industry, the uh, asphalt and concrete industry, the uh, um, uh, oil and gas industry don't want any of this. They, they don't want more solar and, and, and you know, more public transportation and less green. It's not their economic short-term self-interest. The EU is well ahead. You're right. You're absolutely right. The EU is a model. So this is mitigation. This is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now I'm changing topics. This is adaptation. Adaptation. And this is harm reduction to human beings. Now this is a space that I understand. As an epidemiologist, public health person, as a pediatrician, this I get. So we have to do more heat stroke planning and prevention, especially for the isolated elderly. There are heat uh, waves in Europe that killed uh, 10 to 20,000 elderly. When it's really hot and your air conditioning isn't working, or maybe you don't even have air conditioning, and you call the air conditioning company to fix it, they'll be happy to accommodate you three months from now. That's how bad their backlog of work is. Um, I'm an elderly person and I try to open the window of my house, but the painter three years ago painted it shut and I haven't opened it since then and I can't get it open. Uh, I'm an elderly person. I have an air conditioner. I don't have a fan. So um, at the end of the day, we should be opening the windows of elderly persons, making sure that they can be easily opened preventively. We should have fans as backup preventatively. We should have something similar to the silver line. Has anybody ever heard of this? So in the UK, um, very creative uh, folks decided that a lot of the elderly were using health services so they could talk to people. And a lot of the elderly were coming in too late to health services because they weren't able to talk to somebody. So either overuse or underuse of health systems was being facilitated by the inability of the isolated elderly to have somebody to talk to. So they started at a pilot level in one district of the UK, the silver line, like my hair silver. And uh, so it's a, a phone line targeting the elderly. Anybody can use it, but it's being marketed among the elderly. And if, you've, if you're you know, in the Middle East and you're living with your daughter across the street or whatever, maybe you don't need the silver line. But in the Western world where your daughter emigrated to, you know, the, the mainland or the U.S. or something, you may be isolated. And, and this silver line phenomenon can be used for, for climate change issues and health issues in general, but have the ability to identify people who need help quickly. So this is preventive, right? This is public health. Then we have water and energy conservation, um, more judicious heating and cooling thresholds. I hate it when I come to work at Yale University in the summer and the air conditioning is so cold, I need a sweater. And I hate it when I come to Yale University um, and uh, somebody has opened a window in the winter because it's so hot. That's what we do in the United States. Monstrous inappropriate use of energy for inappropriate cooling, inappropriate heating. That's where the EU does much better. You, you, go, to, you go to the EU, you go to your, your, your hotel, and you're going to need a sweater in the winter. And you go to, to your hotel, and you're going to need to have very light clothing in the summer because they're more likely to set the thermostat at uh, 20. Uh, in this or 21 in the summer and set it for uh, 18 or 17 in the winter because they're they're using these cooling heating thresholds to save energy. Uh, measured development and family planning. Do we really want to be 
developing um, 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 uh, housing projects right along the seashore when we know that we are going to have uh, extreme weather events that are going to disproportionately affect people living by the sea? Um, and, uh, and do we really want to say a woman does not want to have a child right now, but we're not going to make it easier for her to access contraception? That's what we mean by unmet need. I'm not talking about forced sterilization. I'm talking about coercion. I'm talking about meeting unmet need. And um, advanced water practice for agriculture and urban use. Um, I take a risk by mentioning the Israelis in Lebanon, but uh, the kibbutz folks in the 1950s figured out drip technology, where only the plant got the water, not 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 the whole the whole um, uh, row where 90% of the water just went into the aquifer and they were drip, dripping the water onto the, the, um, the um, uh, tomato plant or the kale plant or whatever they were growing. Mi minimal water use for maximum agricultural benefit. Um, and these technologies have been around for decades. Uh, re we, we're gonna have to relocate people. We're doing it now in Alaska. There are Native American populations that are living on spits of land near Nome, Alaska, near, near Russia. And, um, and they already have so much sea, sea, sea uh, 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 rise that, uh, that the first storm is gonna take out their whole village. And we're spending millions of dollars moving communities of 100 people, 50 people inland sometimes as far as 40 kilometers inland to get them away from that uh, storm surge area. And we're the richest country in the world. So we're doing this. What about everybody else? And there are countries, entire countries in South Pacific, in South, in, in uh, the Indian Ocean, that the countries themselves are threatened. And entire um, island populations have to be moved. And that's the right thing to do because we're talking about adaptation. Uh, migration is gonna be happening and we can, we can sit back and say, well, uh, we're gonna wait till it happens and then we're gonna declare an emergency or we can plan for it. We can think about the Sahel. You know, the migration from Libya to Italy about, what was it, seven years ago, eight years ago? Remember when there was a huge surge of Africans who found it, it took advantage of Libyan chaos to get to Libya and try to get to Lampedusa or whatever the name of that Italian island is and get to Sicily. And many people died trying to do that. They were mostly young men. They were mostly from the Sahel and they had been mostly sent by their families to get a job in Europe so they could send money back because the, the land was no longer sustainable for the families and the families were relocating. Yep, yep. So, um, their seawalls, very expensive. You know what seawalls are gonna be good for? Miami, not for low and middle income countries. These are billions and billions of dollars of investment so that when there's a storm surge, when the, when the ocean is up you know, four centimeters compared to the history and storm surges are gonna be more devastating, they'll put up a giant seawall and block the storm surge from the city of Miami. None of us know if it's gonna work and it's gonna be tens of billions of dollars to do it. But that's what probably rich countries are gonna do. And uh, then we have, uh, you know, deserts and shorelines. These are the places that are most vulnerable. Vector con control and disease prevention, obviously, and exploiting solar power at household levels where no, do I, we, my wife and I went solar in our house about, I don't know, five years ago, made the investment. And, uh, and then we bought an electric car. So now our electric car is charged by the sun, which is kind of cool. Do I think I'm changing the world? No, but am I trying to influence my neighbors? Yes. And I'm, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm trying to achieve a tipping point in my little community. Um, because if I do it and everybody in this room does it, and I know many of you can't do it, but, but if, if, if we do it and we set examples, maybe there will be a systems effect eventually. Um, 
I haven't looked at my watch and I've gone too, 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 too far. There is some momentum, these COP meetings, which stands for uh, Conference of the Parties. So these climate change COP meetings, Glasgow, Sharm El Sheikh, uh, for the first time we have a loss and damage fund where rich countries are gonna help poor countries mitigate the harms of climate change. That's a good thing. Um, and there are, there are people out there uh, in the US, people like Al Gore and John Kerry who have some prestige. Now we have a climate change and health uh, center, which has a website, might be of some interest to you. We have a, a program on climate change communication, the School of the Environment does. Um, and then we have a program in healthcare, environmental sustainability, focused on, on hospitals and clinics. And then we have a certificate program. And if you've got whatever it is, $49, you can do our Coursera course uh, for very cheap. But um, if you've got $2,000, you can do the full scale certificate, including engagement with Yale faculty and, and, and exams and you get certified. And um, we, we would love to put this to good use. And um, you know, if, the, if, if, if AUB wanted curricular materials, so you could do this yourselves, they're readily available. So um, there's a lot that we can do about global climate change. And uh, number one is, is mobilize politically to get leaders who care about this. We didn't do a very good job with Mr. Trump. We're doing a better job with Mr. Biden. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, um, there's a lot that we can do to stem this, and we owe it to our grandchildren. So thanks for your attention. A few slides are available. I couldn't email them because those movies take so much space, but what I could do is save it on the uh, computer here, and any of you who want these slides can, uh, can, uh, can, use, can have access to them. Yes, yes. I, I don't know what the timing is. I don't have my... That's my fault. I'm so sorry. It's already on the desktop here. It's called Climate Change Lebanon 2023. Our department. Any questions? Yes, I have one. Go ahead. <laughs> We're hearing you loud and clear, and that's another statement. How are you, Stan? I am very sorry not to be at your seminar. This is Rima. Hi, Rima. I am with the flu, so I'm trying to stay away from people. That's understandable. We hope you feel better soon. What's your question? Um, Stan, um, this, is, this was an excellent illustration of uh, the status quo and what's happening currently. And you did mention uh, that uh, those um, large um, corporations that have vested interest in keeping the status quo in, in uh, carbon emission, and they want people to buy cars, for instance, and et cetera. So the question comes, um, how to beat them at their own game, or probably how to make it happen for those people who are employed by those large corporations and very influential politically to, to have something else to do. Because as you said, when people tried, uh, or when, when uh, yeah, when people tried to bring in some ideas, greenwashing kicked in. And so, there was lots of miscavousness. There was lots of uh, um, trying to um, cheat and say that they're doing the right thing, but they're not. So the million dollar question is how to move next and make it happen because it's a dire emergency currently. And it's, it's, we, we cannot afford to keep on saying what we ought to do, but we know that what they are after is profit, money, and money, and money. Yeah, that's right. The, the, uh, 
I haven't won too many personal battles with corporations lately, but I, I will use the uh, tobacco industry as an example, where there was a, there was a fundamental change in society. And uh, it was um, a broad consensus that children shouldn't smoke. And, uh, and um, a good way for children not to smoke is to increase cigarette taxes. That was demonstrated by public health researchers that it wasn't fair to have flight attendants and office mates um, uh, smoking when they were not physically doing the smoking. It was somebody else doing the smoking, but the secondhand smoke was so considerable that they themselves, do you know that flight attendants who were working in the 1940s, 50s, 60s have substantially higher lung cancer rates than anybody else who never smoked a, a cigarette because of the secondhand smoke from, from their jobs. And um, there was a sea change in attitude there. So when society decides that something's unfair and something is unacceptable, uh, in the U.S., which, where we've been pretty aggressive in anti-smoking, we now have the lowest smoking rate of any of the OECD countries, of the high-income countries. We, we, it's the only health index where the U.S. is doing better than everybody else. We're worse than everybody else on the other 12 major indices. But it has everything to do with uh, a change in attitude and change in policy. And even though the tobacco industry was incredibly powerful and incredibly influential in Congress, uh, Congress couldn't stand up against these um, these attitudinal changes among the voters. And we need that kind of uh, that kind of sea change attitude towards the oil and gas industry. And we have to be able to say we are not going to search for fossil fuels anymore. A hundred percent of added um, energy capacity uh, uh, has to be from solar and nuclear, whatever we decide to do. But um, this business of, well, there's a Ukraine war, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to charge up all of our, all of our oil uh, uh, fields again. And uh, Biden is going to permit uh, uh, oil drilling in, in Alaska, which he just, he just allowed when he said he wouldn't. Uh, when we have this fungible approach to, fossil fuels and any excuse we 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 start uh, uh, pumping uh, more and more we have to have uh, the kind of attitude we had towards smoking you cannot smoke in a public building where people are going to breathe your air you can only smoke where only you're going to breathe your air and that's the that kind of thing you cannot pollute my earth with global greenhouse gases you have to re 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 reverse this with policies. Otherwise, you're not going to be my politician anymore. And I'm, I'm going to divest my uh, assets of my, of my you know, pension fund. I mean, you're not going to, we're not going to own your stock. It, it has to be a, a broad swath response to make the kind of difference that we're looking for. Okay. Thank you, Steph. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very uh, big uh, uh, well, sorry, big picture. <laughs> yes, for this very big picture. Thank you very much. Uh, I I was looking at your list for adaptation, and I w I mean it has many many good things where people can change uh, what they're doing and the way they're doing things and the policies. But uh, I grew up uh, with development uh, theory, and uh, I grew up with the idea, and later the idea that the terms of trade are really unfair, and that people in the developing world who are now suffering so much, the Sahel and all these places, uh, if they had better terms of trade, they would have, they would probably be in a better situation now and can manage themselves. And I, I mean, I, I am myself in the field of, of population studies and the idea of family planning and, you know, just getting people, you have to raise their standards of living. This is all we, we grew up with. And that, I mean, the, the unfair terms of trade are a big contribution to the fact that we have this inequality all over the world. And that's in the hands of the big nations. <laughs> So I was just uh, wondering, I mean, uh, we, w how we can bring this thinking back because uh, I grew up with development theory and 
Well, uh, I, 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 I agree with you, and I apologize for the superficiality of my presentation, it's, it's, because it's, to really give this talk, you have to address those issues. Um, yeah. You know, you look at cotton production in the U.S., uh, heavily subsidized by the government, heavily mechanized, uh, you know, the, the folks in Mali growing cotton, uh, West Africa, you know, can't compete. They can't compete uh, at, at, at quality. Uh, and they can't compete in volume, and uh, there's uh, and there's no government subsidy of those farmers. So we we routinely um, manipulate the global markets in our favor. China's now doing the same, even though we used to think of them as a low and middle income country. Now they're behaving very much like an industrial powerhouse, and they're doing their strategic. Uh, in subsidies to drive out other competitors in poor countries. So it is um, part of global uh, economic system that is uh, rewarding return to stockholders of individual, you know, of privately held companies in which the ethics of uh, global economies are not, are not on the table. It's, it's all about the return on investment. That's how we generated slavery. That's how we, you know, it's, it's, it's part of our, our history as human beings. Now, you'd like to think that by 20, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I do think you can force the hand of the big Western corporations. You can, you can have a government mandated um, um, cessation of new dig, dig drilling for fossil fuels. Uh, after, after we drain, uh, the Saudi fields and the American fields and the Russian fields, that, that'll be it. And force the hand of uh, innovators. Um, it is true that many of these uh, um, oil and gas companies actually know exactly what's happening. And they are making major investments in solar. They want to dominate the solar market. They also want to limit the solar market. So they want to dominate it but they don't want to compromise their parent industry. It's almost like a, almost like a cigarette company that, that, is, that is investing in a vaping company. So they still want you to smoke cigarettes, but they know that there's less cigarette smoking. So they want to at least get you hooked on nicotine so that you can buy their vaping products. And then maybe you'll graduate to, to smoking. And that's kind of the way that I think the oil and gas industry is looking at solar. They, they want to make a lot of money from solar. Uh, but they want to sort of make sure that their that their parent industry is also protected. Yeah, right. Somebody had another question. Yes, please. Let me try now. Okay. Uh, thank you for the lecture. And I know this was a very brief part of the lecture. I wouldn't want to reduce it to this, but I want to go back to the issue of nuclear. Um, I have no doubt that nuclear technology, we can, we can say that nuclear technology is safe. Uh, for me, the risk lies in governance. And at the end of the day, if, let's say, diesel-based fuel electricity uh, production system, they face an, an incident, it's relatively manageable compared to having to stop eating from a particular area or using its water for 30, 50, or 100 years. So that's so for me, it's really about, isn't this debate a debate about governance rather than uh, clean, uh, clean energy sources? Is, is a debate, I mean, for me, is our current governance model able to, can we trust our current governance models with nuclear uh production that's uh that's, that's a my great question. that's a great question i mean with all of the sophistication and wealth of the soviet union the united states that's where uh, japan that's where chernobyl three mile island and fukushima happen there you go and so even the rich countries uh, have done poorly in this space. But um, current technologies and current safety measures, uh, my physicist friends tell me, 
uh, are so much better than they were 30 years ago that monitoring for an avoidance of another Chernobyl, another Three Mile Island, another Fukushima is very doable. That's what the nuclear engineers are saying. And I'm not a nuclear engineer and I don't have independent knowledge, so I can't really comment. But if, if even if we say they're safe, and you're saying that's a big if, because the consequence of not being safe is far greater than a truck not being safe, um, then, then we still have the waste disposal. We don't have any solution. Probably the best solution in the United States was a, a mountain called Yucca Mountain, which is in Nevada, very seismically stable, a natural cleft within the mountain that could store decades of nuclear waste from the United States. But nobody will let the nuclear waste be trucked into Nevada, and the people living in Nevada, who are not very many because it's a desert area, don't want it there, and they've never been able to politically get it, get it, get it approved. And it's by far the, the, the best solution. Because even if Yucca Mountain were filled with nuclear waste 150 years from now, all they'd have to do is, is um, lead and concrete fill it, and, and you could go to another Yucca Mountain. So even when we think we have a solution politically, it's not been feasible. So those are the problems of nuclear, honestly. Um, now, the, the, the people I know who used to hate nuclear who like it now, they say, look, the alternative is so dire. The, the, the facing the, the greenhouse gas emissions that I showed you are just up, 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 not, not mitigating at all. And temperatures up, 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 up. And that is so serious that nuclear is worth the experiment because nothing we do in nuclear is as bad as what we're doing now with burning of fossil fuels. That's the alternative argument. I'm just presenting the two arguments. I can't tell you which is right or wrong. Sorry, that was a really excellent presentation, really informative. I just had a quick question around um, the use now of Netflix and ChatGPT and all these kind of new um, you know, streaming and other artificial intelligence and the huge environmental costs. I don't know how they weigh in the scheme of things, but you didn't make any mention of them. And I just seen that that's a growing area that... So uh, the whole world of um, data sciences, um, entertainment, um, uh, cryptocurrency, um, um, internet as the basis of, of commerce uh, has created, a, has exacerbated our energy use crisis. So if we um uh, mobilize more solar um it's it's overwhelmed by by the increased energy use of our highly electronically technically powered economies cryptocurrency are, is a great example where the computing power to keep the records on the cryptocurrency cryptocurrency is not you don't own a bitcoin it's not a physical item it's a it's a blockchain technology that requires intense energy consumption. I wrote a review article with one of my students just last year, I guess, on blockchain technologies. And we tried to highlight that the energy inefficiency was a major concern of, um, of blockchain technology in general for, for data security purposes and blockchain technology for cryptocurrency uh, documentation, which has uh, uh, got nothing to do with data safety per se it's got to do with protecting um investment you know with with this complex uh evolution so there's very little consciousness uh in the field google and microsoft and all the cryptocurrency companies just keep building server uh buildings vast cooling demands um and uh, it's it's getting worse and worse, not better and better. So I and waste, yeah, new, yeah. Uh, and the, you know the, the the technological waste. Right. I mean, you know uh, the, the the heavy metals. Oh, no, you're right. In addition to just the production, yeah. you know, I mean, here at AUB, for example, mm -hmm. we have a whole warehouse 
full of old PCs and screens, um, then what do you do with them? So they're being stocked and stocked and stocked. And then- Well, still... what, what, what best practices is that you have um, a company that tears them apart and reharvests and re and reuses and it's doable. The Chinese have been doing it for years, but Chinese have a lot of labor and low cost labor. And, uh, and that's where that becomes cost efficient. Yeah. If you've got Western European labor costs, it's not cost efficient. They'd rather throw it in a landfill. Sure. But I, I need to modify my slides with these really great ideas you're giving yeah. me. <laughs> Yes, please. So, so since I have the microphone, you uh, certainly do. Judy Machul from the department, the Department of Health Promotion Committee Health. We were supposed to meet with you, but I think this is the best meeting ever. So we will let you go we'll find right time. after that. We'll find yeah. another time. No problem. Um, if if you were to revise your slides uh, for another occasion, and I know you will have many many occasions where you will speak about. Uh, global global warming. <clears throat> I would recommend that you sort of switch the perspective and focus more on the commercial determinants of health, which are the upstream um, causes of causes. Uh, just recently, there's just as we speak, there's the um, uh, World Congress on Public Health in Rome, and uh, looking at Twitter, most of the most of the <laughs> panels and the I wish I was there. Most of the work being done is about um, the uh, the industry and the harm that the uh, industry uh, actors have actually been um, uh, producing on public health uh, in different ways. And we all know that you know. And there's a recent the Lancet uh, Commission. You're aware of that on the, 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 the sorry the Lancet series on the commercial determinants of health. So, you know, after reading all of that and, and listening to what's happening and, and thinking about uh, the commercial determinants health, the industry, you cannot but mention the role of the upstream factors. Uh, your talk was wonderful because it gives, you a, gives us an overview of the outcomes of all of this on the world. Um, on the low-income countries that are the most vulnerable, that are the, the receivers of the industry uh, um, arms, uh, the fossil fuel emissions, and, and all of that. So your talk, I think, would be fantastic in the West, but doesn't apply here. Why? Because it is missing uh, the role of the industry and the corporations and the countries where they are housed, except when you mention India, and that's, but it's all about, you know, population and, you know, and so for me, I was looking at it, you know, I was a student in my own course, looking at a, um, hearing your presentation from a critical perspective. And I thought to myself, there's, there's something missing here because you're, in, you have, you have framed the problems uh, beautifully, but uh, uh, from a perspective that automatically goes to the implications that are parallel to the framing, which is about what the engineers can do, what people can do, what countries can do, but there is more of the uh, global uh, economy that's missing, the, uh, the power of the transnational corporations, that have already actually, that are in bed with policymakers and Gates Foundation and the WHO, and there's a lot of evidence on that. So it's more it's it's more political uh, than what we heard from your from your uh, slide. So I, so that's just sort of you know my take on things. Well, I'm glad that these have come up in the discussion because I think a lot of these critical uh, macro political issues uh, and issues of uh, responsibility of industry and the lack of uh, responsiveness of policy. Not here. Oh, sorry, sorry. I wasn't talking into the mic, but I think it's good that these issues came up in the discussion, uh, even if they were missing from the talk, because I think uh, you have actually made made up for at least five slides on 
on on on on on uh, a perspective that if it's not captured in this kind of talk, it's it's going to make it uh, it's going to impoverish the talk. So thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. I've got to just to offer an explanation to everybody here. Somebody coming for the lecture at the last two slides. Actually, I've attended your lecture all from home together with my wife. And we're so much worried about what you told us about uh, the direction that we are all going into, the world is going into. So the questions were actually resounded over here. And uh, some of the practical possible solutions, uh, how to tackle this problem, that's great. Uh, but uh, it just raises some philosophical question about the lots of things that we have got to change in our life at the individual level, at the higher level society, and then the nations and the whole world. It's a change in philosophy. We have got to maybe stop consuming things. Maybe anything, our clothes, our hair, everything maybe. Whatever, it's a change in philosophy, very deep. But what I want to say one thing is that I want to say thank you from uh, an old grateful student of yours at the Gorgas course some 20 years ago. Thank you, like I would thank David, David, Fre David Friedman, yes. Yes, Stan Vermont, David Friedman and Eduardo Gutuzo. Thank you very much and you are most welcome here in Beirut. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, wonderful. Great to see an alumnus.